I never thought I'd be the kind of guy to lose it, but then again, I never thought I'd catch my wife cheating either. The first time I noticed something was off was when her phone buzzed late at night. It wasn't the usual group chat with her friends, it was a name I didn't recognize, Brandon. At first, I thought it was a coworker, but when I glanced at the screen, the way she quickly swiped it away made my stomach drop that I knew better than to confront her immediately. No, I decided to play it smart. I spent the next few days digging, and the more I found, the colder my blood ran. Late night messages, secret meetups, it was all there, in black and white. She wasn't just unfaithful, she was lying to my face every single day but instead of blowing up, I came up with a plan. I wanted her to feel the same madness creeping up on her, the same fear. I wanted her to question everything she knew, just as I had been. So I started small, moving things around the house when she wasn't looking. Her favorite mug from the top shelf would end up on the kitchen counter, a book she'd been reading would mysteriously appear in another room. At first, she brushed it off as forgetfulness, but I could see the doubt starting to cloud her eyes, then, I began the next phase. I bought a burner phone, one she wouldn't recognize, and started sending her texts. At first, they were innocuous, things like, I'm watching you, or, you shouldn't be alone, but as days passed, they became more direct. You know what you did, he's going to find out, I'd watch from across the room as she'd freeze, staring at the screen, her face draining of color that was when I began whispering to her in the dead of night. While she slept, I would lean in close and murmur things like, he's here, or, run before it's too late, she'd wake up in a cold sweat, clutching the blankets, her breath shallow and quick that I kept it up for weeks, pushing her further toward the edge. I'd find her checking the locks on the doors multiple times a night, glancing nervously at the windows, jumping at the smallest sounds. She started looking like a ghost herself, pale and haunted, shadows under her eyes from lack of sleep, and then I escalated at point one night, after she'd left for another one of her work meetings, I trashed our living room. I overturned furniture, shattered a lamp and smeared red paint on the walls like blood. Then I left a message on the mirror in our bedroom, he knows, when she came home and saw the destruction, the look on her face was priceless. She fell to her knees, sobbing uncontrollably, clutching her phone as if it could somehow protect her, that was the first time she mentioned him to me the imaginary stalker I'd crafted out of her paranoia and guilt. She begged me to believe her, to help her. But I just stood there, acting confused, asking her if she was sure it wasn't just in her head, the seeds of doubt were fully planted now, taking root deep in her mind. She was unraveling, and I was there every step of the way, pretending to be her rock while I pushed her closer to the abyss, the real fun was just beginning, the night after she found the living room destroyed, I made sure to be extra comforting. I held her close, stroked her hair, and whispered that everything would be okay. I promised her I'd take care of it, that I'd keep her safe. But the more I reassured her, the more she seemed to crumble. The guilt, the fear, it was eating her alive, and I made sure to feed it, the next morning, I pretended to leave for work but circled back and parked a few blocks away. I watched our house, hidden behind the tinted windows, waiting for the next step of my plan to unfold. She was too scared to go out, too paranoid to stay alone for long, so I wasn't surprised when she called her lover, Brandon, begging him to come over, when he arrived I could see the tension in their body language, the way they spoke in hushed tones. I imagined she was telling him about the messages, the feeling of being watched. I wondered if she mentioned the strange occurrences around the house, the things moving, the voices in the night, then, it was time to up the ante, while they were distracted inside, I snuck around the back of the house and disabled the security system. It was surprisingly easy, just a quick snip of a wire. I knew exactly what would happen next. The system was old, prone to malfunctioning when tampered with, and it would soon start sending false alerts that I waited until later that evening, when the sky had darkened and the shadows had grown long. From my hidden vantage point, I saw the lights flicker on in the living room, where they sat together, likely discussing what they should do next. That's when I triggered the first alert, an open window in the basement, from the living room window, I saw Brandon's head snap up. He checked his phone, probably reading the alert with growing unease. They both stood up, 
their movements frantic as they tried to figure out what was happening. I could almost hear the panic in their voices as they made their way downstairs to check, but of course, there was nothing there. Just a perfectly secure window, locked and untouched. The system had done its job, planting the first seeds of doubt in Brandon's mind as well. I could see the confusion on his face when they came back upstairs, the way he kept glancing at the system, wondering if it had been tampered with, but I wasn't done why E.T. at A.S. they settled back down, I sent the next alert, a motion detected in the upstairs hallway. This one sent them into a full-blown panic. I watched through the window as they raced upstairs, checking every room, every closet, expecting to find an intruder they didn't find anything, of course. But by now, the tension in the house was palpable. I could see it in the way they moved, the way they clung to each other. I knew that Brandon was starting to suspect something was terribly wrong, and not just with the house. I imagined him wondering if this was all in her head, if maybe she was cracking under the pressure of their affair. But I also knew that she'd be too terrified to think clearly, too caught up in the idea of being stalked, when they finally returned to the living room, I made my final move for the night. I sent another message to her phone, this time with a photo attached. The picture was of them, sitting together on the couch, taken just moments ago from outside the window. The caption read, I'm closer than you think I could see the blood drain from her face when she opened it. She showed it to Brandon, who looked just as pale, his hands shaking as he clutched the phone, she started crying then, real, uncontrollable sobs that shook her entire body. Brandon tried to comfort her, but he was just as scared. I could see the helplessness in his eyes, the dawning realization that they were both trapped in this nightmare that I watched as Brandon finally convinced her to leave the house, to go somewhere safe. They grabbed their things, throwing on coats and shoes in a frenzy, and bolted out the door. I stayed hidden until I saw them drive off, the taillights disappearing into the night, when I finally stepped inside the house, it was eerily quiet. The air was thick with the residue of fear, the kind that clings to the walls long after the screams have faded. I looked around at the mess I'd made, the chaos that had unfolded, and couldn't help but smile, she was breaking, and soon, there would be nothing left and that was exactly what I wanted, the next few days were a careful balancing act. I needed to push her further without tipping her over the edge, at least, not yet. She moved into a hotel, too scared to stay at the house, but that was fine by me. In fact, it made things easier. Hotels are impersonal, sterile places, and the unfamiliarity of her surroundings would only add to her disorientation that I kept sending her messages, playing the role of the relentless stalker. I'd text her from different numbers, switching up the tone, sometimes threatening, sometimes almost friendly, but always chilling. Did you sleep well, or, you can't hide forever I could only imagine the terror each new message brought, how she'd jump every time her phone buzzed meanwhile, I returned to the house, setting the stage for what was to come. I left little signs for her to find when she finally worked up the courage to return, a broken mirror in the bathroom, clothes strewn across the bedroom floor, and most importantly, a handwritten note on the pillow, simply saying, come back soon. We need to finish what we started but that was just the beginning point one night, while she was at the hotel, I used the burner phone to call her. I didn't say anything at first, just listened to her shaky breath on the other end. When she whispered a terrified, hello, I waited a few seconds, letting the silence stretch out, before responding in a low, almost gentle voice, I see you, then I hung up that I didn't call back, leaving her to stew in her fear. I knew she'd spend the rest of the night convinced that someone was watching her, unable to sleep, jumping at every creak and rustle. I could almost feel her anxiety, thick and suffocating, as she lay awake in the dark. By the next morning, she was a wreck. I saw her briefly when I pretended to drop by the hotel to check on her, playing the concerned husband to perfection. She looked terrible. Pale, with dark circles under her eyes, her hands trembling as she tried to hold it together. She clung to me, desperate for reassurance, and I gave it to her, all the while hiding the satisfaction bubbling beneath my skin, when she mentioned the phone call, I feigned shock and worry. I suggested calling the police, but she was too scared, too paranoid that they wouldn't believe her, that they'd think she was crazy. 
That was exactly what I wanted, a growing sense of isolation, of helplessness, as her mind twisted itself into knots and just when she thought it couldn't get any worse, I brought Brandon back into the picture. That evening, I sent her another text, this time from Brandon's number, which I'd cloned. The message was simple, we need to talk. Meet me at the house, I knew she wouldn't be able to resist. Despite everything, part of her still trusted him, still clung to the hope that he could somehow make this all go away, she hesitated, of course, fear still had its grip on her, but in the end, she gave in. I watched from my car as she pulled up to the house, her movements slow and cautious, like she was walking into a trap. She hesitated at the door, glancing around nervously before stepping inside that I followed her in, keeping my footsteps light, staying out of sight as I watched her. She called out for Brandon, her voice trembling, echoing through the empty rooms. When there was no answer, I could see the panic rising in her eyes, the way she clutched her phone like a lifeline, and then I made my move that I had rigged the house with hidden speakers, strategically placed so that no matter where she was, the sound would surround her. I started with a low, almost imperceptible hum, just loud enough for her to notice, to make her question if she was really hearing it. As she moved through the house, I gradually increased the volume, layering in distant whispers, indistinct and unnerving, she was in the living room when the whispers became clearer, more insistent, circling around her like a swarm of angry bees. You shouldn't be here, he's coming for you, run, she spun around, trying to find the source, but there was nothing, just shadows and empty space. She backed up against the wall, her breath coming in ragged gasps, eyes wide with terror, and that's when I let the real horror begin from the speakers and the ceiling, I played the sound of footsteps, slow and deliberate, coming from the direction of the bedroom. I watched as her head snapped up, her body tensing, every muscle screaming at her to run. But she was frozen, caught between the urge to flee and the desperate need to understand what was happening, the footsteps grew louder, closer, and I could see her resolve crumbling. She was shaking, tears streaming down her face, her voice barely a whisper as she called out, Brandon. Is that you? But there was no answer, just the relentless approach of those heavy, ominous steps, finally, when she couldn't take it anymore, she bolted for the door. But I was ready for that. The door slammed shut just as she reached it, the lock clicking into place with a finality that echoed through the house, she screamed, pounding on the door, trying to wrench it open, but it wouldn't budge. The footsteps were right outside the living room now, just beyond the door, please, she cried, sinking to the floor, her body racked with sobs. Please, just leave me alone, and then, as the footsteps stopped just outside the door, I let out a slow, deep breath, the sound amplified through the speakers. It was a sound so close, so intimate, that it felt like I was standing right behind her that I watched as she curled up into a ball, rocking back and forth, whispering to herself, trying to keep the last shreds of her sanity intact, but by now, those shreds were slipping away, falling through her fingers like sand, and I was there to catch them that I didn't let up after that night. I knew she was at her breaking point, teetering on the edge of complete collapse, but there was still a little further to push her. The next few days were crucial, I needed to keep her in that state of fear and confusion, to make sure she didn't have a moment of clarity to realize what was really happening, she didn't return to the hotel after the house incident. I watched her drive aimlessly around the city, her hands white-knuckling the steering wheel as she glanced nervously in the rearview mirror. She must have felt like she was being followed, and I made sure to fuel that paranoia. I followed her, keeping my distance but always staying in sight, just enough to keep her on edge. When she finally pulled into a parking lot and stopped, I parked a few rows behind her, Waiting for her to make the next move, she sat there for a long time, her phone clutched in her hand, her breath fogging up the window as she stared out at nothing. I could almost hear the frantic thoughts running through her mind, where could she go? Who could she trust? Every place must have seemed like a potential trap, every person like a threat. She was alone, truly alone, and it was exactly where I wanted her, eventually, she made a call. I didn't need to guess who it was, Brandon. Her last lifeline, the one person she hadn't completely lost faith in. I saw her talking into the phone, her face twisted in desperation, her body trembling as she pleaded with him for help. Whatever he said, it wasn't enough to reassure her. 
She hung up, tossed the phone onto the passenger seat, and buried her face in her hands. That that's when I made my move. That I had timed everything perfectly. As she sat there, spiraling into despair, I sent the final message from Brandon's number. I'm sorry, but I can't help you anymore. Goodbye. I watched as she reached for her phone, her face lighting up with a brief, fragile hope, only to shatter completely when she read the message. Her scream of anguish echoed through the empty parking lot, a sound so raw and broken that it almost made me feel something, almost, she hurled the phone across the car, where it hit the dashboard and fell to the floor. She was done, completely and utterly defeated, and I knew it was time to end this. But not before the final act that I waited until she finally pulled herself together enough to start the car and drive away. This time, she headed toward her sister's house, a small, secluded place on the outskirts of town. I followed her, keeping a safe distance, making sure she didn't notice me. When she pulled into the driveway, I parked a few blocks away and waited, her sister wasn't home, that much was clear from the empty driveway and the darkened windows. But she didn't care, she just needed somewhere to feel safe, even if it was an illusion. I watched her stumble up to the front door, fumbling with the spare key hidden under a potted plant. She looked like a ghost of herself, hollowed out, a shell of the woman she used to be, when she finally got inside, I waited a few minutes before stepping out of the car. I had brought everything I needed, a small bag containing the last pieces of my plan. The night was quiet, the kind of stillness that makes every sound sharper, every movement more noticeable. But I was careful, silent as I made my way to the house that I disabled the security cameras with a quick, practiced hand, then picked the lock on the back door. I'd done this a hundred times before, but tonight there was a thrill to it, an anticipation that sent a shiver down my spine. Everything was coming together, inside, the house was dark, save for a single light in the living room where she was huddled on the couch, her knees drawn up to her chest, her eyes wide and unseeing. She didn't hear me as I moved through the house, setting things up. The small speaker under the kitchen table, another in the hallway, and the final one just outside the living room door. I made sure everything was in place before retreating back to the kitchen that I didn't need to watch her this time. I could picture her perfectly, sitting there, lost in her fear, waiting for something to happen, knowing it was inevitable. And then, I hit play, the whispers started low, almost imperceptible, just a soft murmur that could easily be mistaken for the wind. But as the seconds ticked by, they grew louder, clearer, filling the house with a chorus of voices that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once, you shouldn't have come here, there's no escape, he's coming, she shot up from the couch, spinning around, trying to find the source of the voices, but there was nothing, just the empty room, the shadows stretching out toward her like hungry fingers. I could see her panic mounting, her breath quickening as she backed away from the living room door, her hands clutching at her head as if she could block out the sound but there was no escape that I let the footsteps start then, slow and heavy, echoing through the hallway like the approach of death itself. She froze, her eyes locked on the darkened doorway, her body trembling with fear. I could see her struggling to move, to run, but her legs wouldn't cooperate. She was rooted to the spot, paralyzed by the horror I'd carefully crafted and then, I added the final touch, a slow creak of the floorboards, as if someone was just outside the room, waiting to step inside, she screamed then, a high, piercing wail that cut through the night, her body jerking violently as she bolted toward the kitchen, her instincts finally taking over. But I was ready for that too. I'd left the back door unlocked, just enough for it to swing open with a gust of wind. When she saw it, she didn't hesitate, she ran, her footsteps pounding against the floor as she fled into the night that I didn't follow her. I didn't need to. She was already broken, beyond repair, her mind shattered into a thousand pieces. I stood there in the kitchen, listening to her frantic footsteps fade into the distance, a satisfied smile curling at the edges of my lips, the plan had worked. She was gone, and with her, any trace of the life we once had. There was nothing left now but the final act, the grand finale that would seal her fate forever, but that would come later. For now, I was content to let her run, let her believe she had escaped. Because I knew the truth, the real terror was still waiting for her, 
lurking in the shadows, ready to strike when she least expected it and when it did, she'd realize that the nightmare was far from over, the night she ran from her sister's house, I let her go, knowing that she would soon return to the one place she dreaded most, our home. It was the only place she had left, the last refuge in a world that had become twisted and unrecognizable. And when she came back, it would be on my terms that I gave her a few hours to wander, to exhaust herself with panic, to reach the point where her fear outweighed her reason. By the time she pulled into our driveway, she was a broken woman, running on nothing but pure instinct. I watched from the shadows as she stumbled toward the front door, her hands shaking so badly that she struggled to get the key into the lock, she stepped inside, the house swallowing her up like a hungry beast. I slipped in behind her, silent as a whisper, and watched as she moved through the darkened rooms, checking every corner, every closet, as if expecting to find her phantom stalker waiting for her. But all she found was emptiness that I had disabled the lights in the living room, so the only illumination came from the faint glow of the moon through the curtains. She didn't notice the shadows shifting in the corners, the subtle movements that hinted at something just out of sight. She was too focused on her growing paranoia, on the oppressive silence that seemed to press in from all sides that I had prepared everything. In the center of the living room, I left a single chair, its back facing the door, a small table beside it with an old-fashioned rotary phone. The phone wasn't connected to anything, but she wouldn't know that. It was all about the illusion, about creating the perfect stage for the final act, she hesitated when she saw the setup, her breath catching in her throat. The chair, the phone, they didn't belong there, and she knew it. But by now, she was too far gone to question it. She was drawn to it, like a moth to a flame, compelled by the need to understand, to find some kind of resolution in this nightmare, she sat down in the chair, her back to the door, her hands trembling as she reached for the phone. It was a reflex, an automatic response, as if dialing a number might somehow connect her to reality again. But there was no dial tone, just the cold, hollow silence of a line long dead that I watched from the shadows, waiting, letting her spiral deeper into the void. She held the phone to her ear, her eyes darting around the room, her breath coming in short, panicked gasps. She was waiting for something, anything, to happen, for the phone to ring, for a voice to break through the silence, but nothing happened. The silence stretched on, suffocating her, pressing down on her like a weight she couldn't lift. I could see the terror in her eyes, the realization that she was completely and utterly alone and that's when I made my move that I stepped forward, just enough for my shadow to fall across the floor in front of her. Her eyes widened, her grip tightening on the phone as she slowly turned her head. The fear in her gaze was so palpable I could almost taste it, a bitter, acrid flavor that lingered in the air, she opened her mouth to scream, but no sound came out. She was beyond that now, beyond words or rational thought. All that was left was the raw, primal fear that had been building inside her for weeks, ready to explode that I took another step forward, my shadow growing larger, more defined. She dropped the phone, her body trembling uncontrollably as she tried to push herself out of the chair. But she was too slow, too weak. The chair tipped over as she scrambled to her feet, her legs giving out beneath her as she crashed to the floor that I was on her in an instant, my hands closing around her wrists, pinning her to the ground. She struggled weakly, her eyes wide and uncomprehending, as if she couldn't believe this was happening, as if she still hadn't fully grasped the truth, but I made sure she understood. I leaned in close, my lips brushing against her ear as I whispered, it's over, her breath hitched, her body going rigid beneath me. I could feel her pulse racing, the frantic beat of her heart as she realized what I meant. There was no escape, no salvation. This was the end that I let her go then, stepping back to watch as she curled into a ball, sobbing uncontrollably. Her mind had finally snapped, the last threads of sanity unraveling as she rocked back and forth, her eyes staring blankly at the wall, she was no longer a person, just a broken shell, a puppet with its strings cut. And I had been the one to cut them, piece by piece, until there was nothing left that I left her there, on the cold, hard floor, and walked out the door without looking back. There was no need to stay, she was finished, and so was I. The house, the life we'd built together, 
it was all a distant memory now, a ghost of a time that no longer existed. As I drove away, I felt a strange sense of calm settle over me. The anger, the bitterness, the need for revenge, it was all gone, leaving only a quiet emptiness. I had done what I set out to do, and now it was time to move on that I didn't know where I was going, and I didn't care. All I knew was that I was free, finally free from the past, from the lies and betrayal that had once consumed me, and as for her, she would spend the rest of her days lost in that darkness, haunted by the shadows I had created, forever trapped in the nightmare that I had crafted just for her, the ultimate revenge.